It was on the Sunday that he took on the city, humble and riding on a donkey, acclaimed by crowds and cheered by children, moving from the peace of the countryside to the corridors of power, giving the beasts of burden a new dignity, giving majesty a new face, giving those who long for redemption a new song to sing. It was on the Sunday that he took on the city. Welcome to our service from the Taunton Dean and South Sedgemoor Methodist Circuit for today, Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, the beginning of the time when we reflect on the last week of Jesus' life on earth before his death. I'm going to read the Lent liturgy for Palm Sunday, coming from John chapter 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And a prayer. Let the picture of a king on a donkey be hung in every leader's gallery, every politician's office, every scholar's library, every minister's study, and be seen in every disciple's life. Amen. So you may have a palm cross with you, perhaps from a previous year that you've saved, maybe one that you've received this year. I invite you to have your palm cross in an obvious place today so that you can reflect on it throughout the service and so that you can raise it during some of the hymns. We're going to sing the first of those hymns now. All glory, Lord and honour to you, Redeemer King. Let's sing. Oh 
Now our prayer of praise and a prayer of confession. Let us pray. Hosanna, son of David. We greet you as the fulfilment of all our hopes. You alone hold the keys of the kingdom. You alone can show the world how leaders ought to lead, how kings ought to rule, how power ought to be exercised, how politicians ought to serve, how priests ought to minister, how ordinary people can be saints, how donkeys can pull royal coaches. You are worthy of honour and power, yet you come to us in humility and meekness. You deserve worship and glory, yet it's the last thing you ask for. Accept our hosannas this day. May they be accompanied by lives of obedience to your way and deeds of service and reconciliation to your name. Merciful God, today we are reminded of our human fickleness. We cry hosanna one minute and crucify the next. We are hot and cold humanity, unreliable and selfish. We have allowed Good Friday to be repeated throughout the generations and across the centuries, refusing to see clearly the meaning and message of Palm Sunday. Forgive us for our hollow hosannas, for seeking a God to match our national dreams and private goals for failing to look into Jesus' eyes or understand his mind and heart, for persisting in our worship of narrow horizons and exclusive attitudes. Ride into our tired lives, turn over our tables of prejudice, put to flight our doves of deceit and help us to build our lives as cities of love and temples of justice, pointing to your kingdom of liberation and joy. We ask these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now a reading from Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2 and 19 to 29. I'm going to put the words on the screen and you might like to say it along with me. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his steadfast love endures for ever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures for ever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O God. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, I will extol you. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Thanks be to God for that wonderful psalm of praise. They say that everyone loves a parade. Think of a time when you have stood and watched a parade making its way through the streets, celebrating a special occasion. Remember the church parades that maybe were a regular feature of the Sunday morning services? The marching bands and the youth organisations 
scrubbed and smart in their uniform. Remember the carnival parades in the good old days before health and safety, when children dressed up and piled onto trailers lined with hay bales and pulled by tractors, courtesy of the local farmer. Think of the company of athletes who parade at the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games, for example. The sense of occasion, the celebrating, the spectacle. Think of the decorated floats of the Bridgewater and the North Petherton carnivals. Loud music, people dressed up in strange costumes. We stop what we're doing, we go out and we take notice. Of course, the whole point of a parade is that we do stop what we're doing and take notice. Sometimes the parade is a demonstration to publicise a concern and the parade tries to engage us, the onlooker, to be more than an onlooker and to be drawn into action to support the concern. You can't have a parade in private. There's no point because parades are meant to make a statement. But perhaps not everyone loves a parade. The American actor and social commentator Will Rogers said in 1924, parades should be classed as a nuisance and participants should be subject to a term in prison. They stop more work, inconvenience more people, stop more traffic, cause more accidents, entail more expense and commit and cause hundreds of misdemeanours. Because of course the other thing about parades is that they can make people nervous, particularly those people who stand to lose something if the parade is successful. Before we think about that more and before we listen to the Palm Gospel for today, let's sing an old hymn, one that I used to love as a child, Children of Jerusalem.
I'm very grateful to my friend Hazel for um, agreeing to read the Gospel for us today. It comes from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, and since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Thanks be to God for this reading of his word. Amen. Thank you very much, Hazel. Let's pray. Eternal God, we thank you for your word to us through the scriptures, which lead us again through the events of your passion. In this holy season, we bring our lives as a daily offering to you and place them under your authority. So would you grant to us now your Holy Spirit and apply your truth to our hearts, that from the written word and by the spoken word, we may once again encounter the living word, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you had been waiting at the traffic lights in North Taunton a few days ago, you may well have been startled by the sight of people in historical Middle Eastern dress hurrying by you may have seen a man dressed in a white robe, watched carefully by a haughty-looking Pharisee, by two stern-looking Roman soldiers poised ready to step in, as excited children joined in with the crowd that followed along behind. Or perhaps your eye was drawn to the drama enacted a little later on St Andrew's Green, as that same man staggered under the weight of a heavy wooden cross to the place of his execution. People must be wondering what is happening, one of the children said to me. What we were doing was part of our joint initiative of Easter Cracked, which five churches in North Taunton offer to children from six primary schools in this part of the town. And what we were doing through drama and action was what many across the country will do in their services this morning. They will retell the story of the last week of Jesus' life, his trial and his death. Only when we did it last week, we took the story on to Easter Day and included the empty tomb. And we did it to make the story come alive so that the children could not only watch and listen, but also participate, which helped them to imagine what it might have been like to have actually been there in Jerusalem as one of the crowd, as the events of the week unfolded. Drama helps tell the old stories in new ways 
and helps us to recognise things we might not otherwise notice. And drama was what Jesus was doing on that first Palm Sunday. He was acting out a scene in an old, old story, helping people to recognise its relevance and giving it a new meaning. Passover was approaching and pilgrim pilgrims were crowding into the city. They would be retelling the story of Moses and the Exodus, the plagues in Egypt, the Passover lamb, the crossing of the Red Sea, the promise of freedom at last. And most of that retelling would happen in homes and around meal tables, not out on the street. But that big story would create a special atmosphere in the entire city. For this wasn't just history, this was God's continuing story and everyone was part of it. So it was their story too. It was a story of freedom which they longed for, for their own day. Jesus has been making his way to Jerusalem and the journey's over. The almost secret journey in which Jesus has been avoiding crowds, avoiding any kind of confrontation with enemies and making little contact with sympathisers, as if he was determined to arrive in Jerusalem and not in any way to have his journey cut short before he could do so. But now, all secrecy, all anonymity, all caution is thrown to the wind. Jesus rode in from the east, from the Mount of Olives. He had made the arrangements in advance so that everything had been carefully planned. The disciples had their instructions for procuring the donkey and Jesus' followers spread their cloaks on the road. They praised God with the words of Psalm 118, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. This was the psalm that the pilgrims always sang on their way to Jerusalem, a song of victory, a song of praise to the God who defeats all his foes and establishes his kingdom. On this day, Jesus himself was coming as the fulfilment of the nation's hopes. It all began to look very like a political demonstration. But another point is being made in this demonstration too. There were those in the crowd who were wanting to raise not only their voices but swords against their Roman occupiers. And this demonstration is saying something to them. And Mark is careful to point it out. Here is your real king, lowly and humble, riding on a donkey, not on a war horse, but on the king's beast of peace, a ceremonial animal, not a military one. And it's very likely that around the same time on the opposite side of the city, another parade has entered Jerusalem. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, rode in on a military horse at the head of a column of imperial soldiers, proclaiming the power of the Roman Empire. Imagine what that might have looked like. Cavalry, horses, foot soldiers, leather armour, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, sun glinting on metal and gold, the sound of marching feet, the creaking of leather, the clinking of bridles, the beating of drums, the swirling of dust. Awed, curious, resentful eyes, watching as Pilate entered the city from Caesarea Maritima, his new and splendid city on the coast where he lived, to be in Jerusalem for the festival, in case there was trouble. To keep the peace at all costs, through force and violence. The kind of peace which would benefit the empire and the whole system of domination which supported it. But Jesus' procession embodied a different vision, the kingdom of God, a kingdom of peace. His was the peace surpassing understanding and much of what was about to unfold 
in the next few days will be the price he pays for bringing that peace. Jesus was using the symbolism from the prophet Zechariah, which would not have been lost on the crowds. According to Zechariah, a king would come to Jerusalem, humble and riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This king would banish war from the land and announce peace to the nations, and his rule would extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. You can find it in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. Jesus' actions that day were to announce the arrival of that king and that kingdom, the fulfilment of that prophecy. No wonder the people threw their cloaks on the ground and waved the palm branches in celebration and everyone got into the spirit of things by praising God at the top of their voices for what God was doing in Jesus. In the simple but symbolic action of that first Palm Sunday, the die was cast. The divided city responded in different ways. Looking ahead through the events of the following days, we know that some see who Jesus is and serve him. Others are drawn to him, but expect the outcome to be different and they're disappointed when it all goes wrong. Still others are hostile and go out of their way to trap him. And it's the same today. Humanity is divided in its response to the servant king. Day by day, somehow we are among the crowd, watching as Jesus passes by. And we are shouting, Hosanna, glory in the highest. Or perhaps we're joining in the Pharisees disdainful, tell them to be quiet. Or perhaps we say, great, a king. Now, a king looks like this and does these sorts of things. So why is our world as it is? Why doesn't he change things? How will we live as Holy Week unfolds? Of course, it's very tempting to move from the celebration of today straight into the glory of Easter Sunday. But don't we have to live through a Gethsemane, a Good Friday of one form or another, not only in our personal lives, but also in our public ones? And unless we pray with Jesus in the gathering shadows, unless we walk with him the way of the cross, unless we wait with him in the darkness of Holy Saturday. We cannot hope to be ready to experience the joy and the victory of Easter Sunday. Today we have a choice. Will we just be curious, detached spectators watching the parade from the sidelines? Or will we actually be part of the parade, praising and proclaiming the importance of this peaceful, humble, challenging, kingdom-announcing Jesus, each step of the way through betrayal to forgiveness, through suffering to joy, through death to resurrection life? Can we walk the way that Jesus walks? Can we follow him as he goes to the cross? Now here's a hymn which reminds us of the nature of Jesus, both the kingship and the servanthood, looking towards the events of Holy Week and Jesus' death. Servant King, Northallerton, Methodist Church Choir leads us in the singing.
in more normal times, Bethphage near Bethany is a pilgrimage site in the Holy Land. Although the exact location of the ancient village is uncertain, the memory of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is kept in a Franciscan church built beside the steep road that descends from the Mount of Olives. Above the altar there's a mural of Jesus riding into Jerusalem and around the walls are beautifully simple medieval paintings. We saw some of the slides during the service and we can catch them at the end if you miss them. But only in the Gospel of Luke do we hear Jesus' words over Jerusalem. Luke writes, As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Malcolm Geit, the theologian and poet, has written a poem called Jesus Weeps. Jesus comes near and he beholds the city and looks on us with tears in his eyes and wells of mercy, streams of love and pity flow from the fountain whence all things arise. He loved us into life and longs to gather and meet with us, beloved, face to face. How often has he called a careful mother and wept for our refusals of his grace, wept for a world that, weary with its weeping, benumbed and stumbling, turns the other way. Fatigued compassion is already sleeping, whilst her worst nightmares stalk the light of day. But we might awaken yet and face those fears, if we could see ourselves through Jesus' tears. This is the beautiful arched window in the little church in Jerusalem called the Church of Dominum Flevet, which means Christ weeps. And it commemorates a place halfway down the Mount of Olives where Christ may have stood as he wept over the city where he was to meet his death. And looking out over the panoramic view today, it's not hard to imagine the temple an impressive building of marble and gold, bronze doors, colonnades, rising up above the narrow streets and houses where the women, men and children of Jerusalem lived and worked and went about their business. And it's a poignant thought to think of Jesus weeping for the people of the city. And I think it's a particularly significant verse for us to consider today because it's not only about Jerusalem, though it is. It's about all cities, all people. It's about Rafa and Kiev and Tehran and Aleppo and Kabul and Karachi and Addis Ababa and Harare and London and a thousand other places where there is violence and prejudice and fear. Christ still weeps over us. He looks and he weeps. So we're going to pray for those places and people who long for peace. Let's pray in peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the true King of Peace. In you alone is found freedom. Loving and holy God, we bring to you the needs of your world. For those who make laws, interpret them, administer them. We pray for your wisdom and guidance, that our common life may be ordered in justice and mercy. We pray for those caught in the desperation of conflict and war. And we give thanks for those who have the courage to 
call and to work for peace. We pray for your world in conflict. We pray for unity among troubled nations. May your peace reign in every heart. Dispel the darkness and evil and protect the dignity of every human life. Replace hatred with your love. Give wisdom to world leaders. Free them from selfish ambition. Eliminate violence and war. We pray for unity among the nations, among the people, for the most vulnerable, for those suffering, for the fearful, for those most in need, for us all. May we recognise your presence amid each mess we've made. Give us your painful blessing of tears for all we've done and all we cannot prevent. In the salt of tears, may we taste our human, common humanity and through them help us to see the way that leads to peace. We bring all our prayers together as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So now we join together in our final hymn, and if you have a palm cross, or maybe one that you've made, you might like to lift it high as we sing, lift high the cross. And as we do that, we might just think what it means to lift high the cross in our prayers, through our actions, through our lives.
set up thy throne, that earth's despair may cease beneath the shadow of its healing peace. May this be our prayer for God's world, for ourselves, for those we love, this day and all days. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be ours for evermore. Amen. I danced in the morning when the world was begun And I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth At Bethlehem I had my birth Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he danced for the scribe and the Pharisee But they would not dance and they wouldn't follow me I danced for the fishermen, for James and John They came with me and the dance went on Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he I danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lame The holy people said it was a shame They whipped and they stripped and they hung me on high And left me there on a cross to die Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you When the sky turned black It's hard to dance with the devil on your back They buried my body and they thought I'd gone But I am the dance and I still go on Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And lead you all wherever you may be They cut me down 